Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study. Um, we're going to begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for every morning that we can spend studying together, that we can receive light from your word. We are thankful for the people who are searching for truth. We just ask, Lord, that as we come together, there again this morning, that your Holy Spirit can speak to each heart. We know, Lord, that we are struggling in trying to understand your will and your purpose for us. And we know that the light that has been coming from the book of Judges has been a great blessing. It's brought a conviction of our need of you. And it has also shown that you understand our needs and that you provide light just as we need it. And so we pray, Lord, for your blessing again, that your Holy Spirit can once again open up your words to us. <clears throat> we pray for those that are struggling, and we pray for this movement. We know, Lord, that Satan is angry and seeking who, whom he may devour. He knows he has only a short time. And we know, Lord, that you have given us time. So we ask we, that we can use this time wisely. Be with us now, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. And... Um, so yesterday we were struggling with Judges 13. Mostly I was struggling just because I needed more input and feedback. And um, usually I get that from Dwight, but he did send uh, a paper uh, or some thoughts anyway, notes on Judges 13. And, and so Dwight, we can look at that right now. Certainly. Now, I mean, here is his thought. He has a bunch of information prior to this. So this is more the conclusion. Um, but he had this idea that uh, maybe we should look at uh, Judges 13 as being chiastic, a chiastic prophecy. And so he's looking at these 40 years that we addressed um, and there's a quote, um, quote from the spirit of prophecy, February 26th, 1902, where it says, notwithstanding all that God had wrought for his people in the wilderness, the children of Israel, after their settlement in Canaan, continued to walk in their own ways. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works and they served their idols which were a snare unto them. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. He gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Um, so I guess one of the things you could see here is that you have the 40 years in the wilderness, and then you have the 40 years of the Philistines, is that kind of what you're seeing, Dwight? It's part of what I'm <clears throat> what I'm seeing here, but it was reading the entire section from Psalms 106, 34 to 42 okay. that brought this very clear. Okay. So Psalm 106. Um and we get 106 34 to 42 right so uh, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the lord commanded them but were mingled among the heathen and lived their works and they served their idols which were a snare unto them yea they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, 
and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance and gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under, under their hand. Okay, um, so what is it you see particularly? When you're looking at the land is polluted, we're also very cognizant of the fact that the land needed to rest. Yeah. Now, in the sacrifice of the sons and daughters, mm -hmm. at this time, they're talking literally about the situation with Molech and with the other gods of, of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Figuratively, they're pointing forward to what's been going on with abortion. Okay. I, I've always applied that more to um, the education. Well, you can apply it to the education as well because they both have the same issue. What do you mean they both have the same issue? The educational system right now does not prepare anyone for the kingdom to come. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the children are just as much sacrificed there as if they were to have been not given the education and were that their blood was spilled through abortion, that they were killed. But Adventists aren't aborting their own kids, are they? I mean, I thought that our hospitals are just giving abortions to The Adventist healthcare system is one of the leading providers of abortion in the country. Well, I understand that, but I'm just saying that they're not aborting. Adventists aren't aborting their children. They're just aborting other people's children. Do, I mean, that, that's one of the points that, you know, at this, at this junction, we cannot always say I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that we're going to find that, that abortions have gone on within the Adventist church, just like it's gone on within the world. Hmm. Well, I guess that's always, you know, possible with some people, but I, I don't know personally any Adventists who are in favor of abortion, other than uh, the people at the institutions who are providing them. And even then, a lot of them, uh, you know, that are providing abortions that are institutions aren't actually Adventists either, many of them, but. So in this situation with the, with the 40 years of wilderness wandering being, you know, combined with this, where the is the Israel had served the Philistines for 40 years, oh. it's the Lord more that is, is giving us that portion because there's quite a bit in the 40 years that I think we can apply in looking at this in detail. So there's there's quite a bit. I mean, the alternate reading here, and the children of Israel added to commit evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. So the children of Israel in choosing to follow after the Philistines, we're adding sin upon sin. And isn't that really what we've been seeing happening within the church since its founding? Oh, well, yeah. See, here, the problem that I have is that, you know, we're understanding... I mean, we're making an application of judges um, that has to do with this movement from 2001 to 2023. Right. So I'm always having problems when we try to bring this larger um, 
structure, this larger line into what we're studying. Well, you know, the one the one section of judges that we touched on at the outset and we really haven't gone back to also establishes that larger line. Which what are you referring to? Judges 18 to the end of the chapter or to the end of the book. Right. So I would agree with you there, except that where that that is put as a different section it, it's taken out of its context, put at the end. And, and so where, where I'm taking this is when we go from chapter two and then to the end of Samson, that that is our history. And I would agree that we can take the end of that and we can apply it then to a bigger line, which is why I think it's separated out for us anyway. Um, so to me, this just creates, uh, you know, it creates a huge complication for me trying to um, establish what we've been doing with Samson and with all the other judges, if we do that. that that's, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not correct, because, you know, it could be correct in some other application, but I don't know if if that's going to tell us anything about what we're doing. Um, I mean, so, I mean, that's, that's the problem I'm having. So, I mean, I could be completely wrong in what I'm saying. <clears throat> but every time we try to pull out from our line into the bigger lines, we run into problems. So, you know, we can't mix the two applications. Does that, that make sense or to anybody? Either? Yeah, so, so are, there are points here. So when you're de dealing with uh, verses two to five, talking about Manoah, who's from Zora, defined as hornet wasp, as in stinging, um, this is a numerical representation of 1886. Is this a numerical this representation? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I would do that because now 1886 you're marking as specifically what? As we have addressed many times in the Friday meetings, you cannot have 18. You, you cannot have the message of 1888 without understanding the conflict of 1886. Right? Yeah, the conflict of 1886 has to do with this inspiration of the spirit of prophecy, the inspiration of the Bible. Is that what you're referring to? No, I'm referring to the fact that you have the, the way that... Um, Butler looked <clears throat> at the law in Galatians and the way that Wagner looked at the law in Galatians. And as Mrs. White pointed out, neither had the entire concept right. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that that's what Ellen White said. Okay, then what did she say? She said that the law in Galatians includes also the ceremonial law. Did she not say, <clears throat> did the angel not say to her that neither had the entire idea right? Um, well, that's not how, okay, where is this statement? Because um, I understood this differently. Um, so do you know where this is? I'll have to look for it. Okay, because... I mean, there are there were two different views. The idea that that the law in Galatians referred only to the ceremonial law, or that the law in Galatians referred to only to the moral law. I don't understand that Wagner was teaching that it was only the moral law. So that wouldn't make any sense to me. 
but I would agree that that Ellen White was clear that it includes both the moral and ceremonial law. So I, I, I don't understand, because I've heard that before, but I haven't been able to see it in Wagner's writings or in Joan's writings either. So. Okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, and I would, I, I personally wouldn't put that much emphasis on 1886 as a symbolic date or waymark. Now, does she mention Wagner and Butler? Does she, how does she make the statement? As I recall, she mentioned the angel mentioned both of them. Okay, so the angel is going to mention the names of them. Okay, so this is. This is one. There's the state there. That's eighteen eighty seven. So this is Elder J. H. Wagner, that's E. J. Wagner's dad. Okay. She was shown his position in regard to the laws law was incorrect. And from statements I made to him, he has been silent upon the subject for many years. I've not read Elder G.I. Butler's pamphlet or any articles written by any of our writers. I do not mean to. But I did see years ago that Elder J.H. Wagner's views were not correct. And led to him matter which I had written. The matter does not lie clear and distinct in my mind yet. I cannot grasp the matter. Right, and then there's, um, I've not changed my views in reference to law in Galatians, but I hope that I shall never be left to entertain the spirit that was brought into the general conference. I have not the least hesitancy to say it was not the spirit of God. If every idea we have entertained in doctrines is truth, will not the truth bear to be investigated? Will it totter and fall if criticized? If so, let it fall. The sooner the better. The spirit that would close the door to investigation of points of truth in a Christ-like manner is not the spirit from above. Um, she says, A.T. Jones and Dr. Wagner hold views upon some doctrinal points, which all admit are not vital questions, different from those which some of the leading ones of our people have held. But it is a vital question whether we are Christians, whether we have a Christian spirit and are true, open, and frank with one another. Um, so we need to investigate the scriptures. Other side has, side has all the light on the law in Galatians. If you speak of the affliction that came upon you because of the way this matter, the question of the law in Galatians has been pushed and urged by responsible men in the cause and by your seeming attitude, which it brought me to present con to my present condition more than any other one thing. I have no knowledge of taking any position in this matter. I had not with me the light God had given me on this subject in which had been written, and I dared not make any rash statement in relation to it till I could see what I had written upon it. My attitude, therefore, could not be helped. I had not read Dr. Wagner's articles in the signs, and I did not know what his views were. He, Alan White's angelic guide, stretched out his arms toward Dr. Wagner and to you, Elder Butler, and said in substance as follows, neither have all the light upon the law, neither position is perfect, Light is shown for the righteous and gladness of the upright in heart. There are hundreds that know not why they believe the doctrines they do. So that must be the statement you're referring to. Yes. 
Okay. So it's a little bit different. So I would agree uh, that neither had all the light and neither position is perfect because Wagner's position was not. Um, but I was thinking more of the statement where she says that the law in Galatians contains both the moral and the ceremonial law. I was not referring to that one. Which, which, um, so yeah, so their views are not perfect. Um, that's not necessarily saying that they're, that, uh, what you were saying, because you were saying, how were you saying it? Well, <clears throat> I was saying it poorly. Okay. And this is what, what I was giving reference to. Because this more means that we have something more to study in understanding this truth. It's not really finding a fault with, with Wagner in any particular point. I'm not trying to find fault with Wagner. Neither mm -hmm. am I trying to find fault with Butler. But both participated in what was a conflict in the 1886 General Conference session. I find it interesting that this letter, as you're bringing it up, has a has a good symbol involved in that it's letter 21 of 1888. Yeah. And of course, here we also are looking that the date on it was October 14th. Now, um, so I'm not familiar with the 1886 General Conference. Um, um, I didn't, I never heard of the conflict that occurred between the two at the 80, 1886 General Conference, so I don't know anything about it. Well, in the 1886 General Conference, Wagner had presented a view of the Book of Galatians within the signs of the times. Butler chose to respond, and in 1886, while Ellen White was in Europe, Mm -hmm. They had a huge disagreement as to which one was correct. There were a few that felt that Dr. Wagner had points to consider. There were many that believed that they should be listening to Elder Butler since he was then the president of the conference. This set the table for what went on in 1888. Now, one of the other things that I have looked at, and mm -hmm. I'm, having, I'm having to think through, we have placed <clears throat> quite a bit of our... I don't want to say faith, but we we have agreed that number numbers as symbols are important for us to consider. Yeah. Now, I find it very interesting. As I have been looking at different points, that there were there so far have been 61 general conference sessions. Of those 61 sessions, six have been special sessions. However, the 24th and the 25th general conference sessions, one in 1885 and one in 1886 both ended on exactly the same day so far they are the only general conference session that have ended on exactly that same day okay so and that date is december 6th yeah december 6th so so December 6th of 1885, followed by December 6th of 1886, they both began on the same day, which was November 18th. Okay. So that's, yeah, number 24, number 25. 
Okay. So <clears throat> you have 25, which is five by five, but also 12, six or one, two, six, which we have accepted as a, a fractal of the 2520. And both of these meetings took place in Battle Creek, Michigan. So I just found that the, the timing of those meetings was a bit odd. Or prophetic, however you want to look at it. Okay. So the reason behind this, when I was looking at this about Manoah being from Zora and Zora being Hebrew 6881, we have 1886 there just in reverse. Okay. So, so the problem I have would have with this is I'm going to use a verse number when something is already established in some way. So we already have, you know, a whole structure. And then we start to notice these verse numbers and they, tell us the same thing, right? So now in 1886, I don't, I, I've never seen that as a way mark, right? We have 1888. Now we could have a line of 1888 where we take events that happened beforehand and, and afterwards that address that as the line, but we've never, we've never drawn that line. And so in that line, obviously, 1886, if we were to draw that line, it would be a way mark there. Right? I'm listening. Yeah. So, so to me, it's just in, in how we're making this application right now of the story of Samson, we're applying it to this movement. And so we can apply these numbers of these words because they directly relate to our application. But I don't know that we can do that with other lines. Does that make sense to you? I am considering what you are saying. Because we have in our line the special use of numbers that we can use in analyzing um, judges, right? Because it's, it's referring to our movement. I would not do that on a larger basis that's not relating to our movement, right? If it's not relating to our line specifically. So this is relating to 1886. And unless we could connect that somehow to our line, let's say we put December 6th, uh, you know, 2020, and somehow we could, we could connect this story, this line here, and then we could parallel it with what happened in 1886. Then, then I would do that. And, and maybe we can do that, right? But you understand how, how, how I'm doing this? Because I'm quite specific on how I look at things. And I'm not always good at explaining it. Um, that things in the past can relate to our lines. Numerically, they, we can connect um, a date in, in the past with, with the present line, and it can give us information about what, what our line means. But I still don't think we can take the story of judges and expand it into this larger line and then, and then say that we're studying our line, right? We would be studying the larger line. And, and so that, that's the problem that I'm struggling with. Now, I could be wrong in how I'm seeing this, right? so I admit that. But I have a way in which I understand it. And so, you know, I'm trying to be, trying to be open in, in looking at this. But, you know, and I, I've been wrong before. And when I'm wrong, and then I see that I'm wrong, it, you know, it's some insight that's that's usually extremely important. So that's why I'm not just ready to get rid of it.
because we know Manoa represents rest, right? It's basically the same name as, as Noah, which is the mem in front of it. So <clears throat> we know that Noah represents rest. Yeah, and so and does we have, we have here Manoah, and that's to represent rest as well. Yeah, it, well, it just has the mem in front of it. That's just a prefix. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there a meaning to the prefix? Yeah, it means from rest. Okay. Right. I mean, you could say it means from Noah. I mean, if you wanted to be uh, more specific. But, um, yeah, let me look here. I'm just going to make sure that I'm reading this. So when I look at the Hebrew here of this word, um, it just has the man in front and So, so anyway, the point that we're trying to make there has to do with um, uh, can we connect 1886 and Manoa to that history? That is, is there a parallel between 1886 specifically and something like, because you're going to use 1886, that's the general conference. Well, we have two dates there. Uh, we have November 18th and December 6th. Does November 18th to December 6th represent in some way uh, the conference that was initiated by um, FFA? I'd have to go back and look. Okay. I mean, the, the situation that I found odd is that both the 24th and the 25th general conference sessions were held on exactly the same calendar dates. Yeah, which, which is kind of odd in the sense that they're, uh, they're a year apart. And normally they would start them on the same day of the week, you would think. But um, it just seems kind of odd. So the beginning dates and the ending dates being the same, but it was the fact that they both ended on December 6th in consecutive years that I found to be very strange, especially given what we've already gone through with FFA's pronouncement on December 6th of 2020. Yeah. Very good comment that Angela made in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what she did there is what I was doing. Um, yeah. The 18 day span, six plus six plus six. So there's 18 days there. And um, so in, I was trying to analyze these dates as well. Um, now 11 times 18 is um, 198. I was trying to see if there's anything there. Um, let me see. There's got to be something more about that 1118. That 1118 reminds me of something, but I can't think what. So anyway, we ha we have we have uh, some symbols there. Um, so what I'm trying to do here, so with with Manoa, um, uh, 
Um, now it's interesting. <clears throat> if we include the end date of that calculation, yeah, we have a period of 19 days. Yeah, it's 19 if it's inclusive. Yeah. Now, 19 again as a as a figure we have from Isaiah 7. Yeah, a metonic cycle. Well, we have That's the metonic cycle, yes, but I'm <clears throat> I'm speaking of the 19 years to Israel. Yeah, I understand. So and, and that, that we noted right from the beginning was a metonic cycle. At least I did. Um, right. And and so the purpose of that, the 19 and the 46, to get the 65, um, the significance then was that it was a metonic cycle. And a metonic, metonic cycle is 235 months. Right. <clears throat> right. So it's 235 months. And from 977, um, to, um, 742, where that 19 years is going to begin is 235 years. Right. And then it's followed by a symbol of 19 years, which is 235 months. So that was that's part of the significance of that 19 years. Now, 35 months, it represents the 235 years. So from the time the kingdoms divided until that prophecy of the 65 years is given. There's 235 years. And then after 235 months. Northern Israel uh, is forsaken of its king. The land of Israel is forsaken of the king of the north. And then 46 years later, we have the land of the southern Jew Israel is forsaken of its king. So anyway, that's uh, what I'm saying here is that we connect with, with these 19. It connects us to that history. So the beginning of a prophetic mirror. So you were talking about a chiasm, right? Correct. So can we put a 19 at the end of our line here that relates to it? So if you go from 2001 to 2020, is that 19 years? Yeah. Okay. So can we take those 19 days to represent 19 years that end on December 6, 2020? Well, I'm, I'm going to throw a different question at you. Okay. I, I think that the answer to what you just asked is yes, but I'm going to throw a different question at you. Okay. Uh, the total span of time from the 1885 Mm -hmm. general conference to the closing of the 1886 was 383 days. Okay. So that is, um, so let me see here. So you're going to, um, um, okay. What's your question then regarding that? Well, <clears throat> wouldn't that be a, a leap year in the Jewish reckoning? Yeah, so that would be uh, a deficient um, embolism. Right, that means it's because there is there's three different lengths of a leap year. You can have a deficient year, uh, a regular year, and a complete year, right? So because you can have up to 385 days. So um, that conference in 1885 starts on the 10th day of the eighth month. Okay. But it's going to end on um, 
So December 6th is the 10th day of the ninth month in 1886. So it's going to start the 10th day of the eighth month in 1885 and end on the 10th day of the ninth month. So it ends up being uh, one year and one month on the biblical calendar from the start of the meeting in 1885 to the end of the meeting in 1886. Okay. That's helpful at all. Yeah, so it's 383 um, uh, days. So it ends up being a, a symbol of, of a, uh, a Hebrew year. Now, if we go from the rabbinic calendar in 1885, it's going to be the 10th day of the ninth month uh, that it starts, but it's going to be the ninth day of the ninth month that it ends. So the rabbinic calendar doesn't line up properly with the months, but um, but the biblical calendar it's one year and one month to the day, from the start of the one to the end of the next. Whatever that means, you know, we're just kind of analyzing this. Um, right. The three eighty so so the three eighty three tells us it's a year and a month. I guess is what we would say. And and what would that represent? Well, when we're saying a year and a month, that would mean that would be 13 months. Okay. So so there you go. 13 months. Symbol of rebellion. Yep. Okay. So that I think would be the significant symbol there. Now, when we go to um, December 6, 2020, now we had that one start. Now, it starts on November 30th, right? Uh, that we have, or is it October 30th that they have? The I believe it's October 30th. Okay. And um, so... What yes, date did they? What date did they close off communication with? Uh, December sixth, twenty twenty. So they they okay. it ends on December sixth. So that's going to be um from eighteen eighty six to twenty twenty. You got a um, hundred and thirty four years. Is that right? So 134 years. I'm counting that right. 14 plus 20 is 34. Yeah, 134 years apart. Um, So what are you seeing on 134? Well, it's of Gregorian months, it's 1,608 months. And I was just trying to see if there's any significance of that. Uh, nothing comes to mind. Well, 1608, if you unscramble that, would point to 1860. Yeah, but I don't know if I would do that. Um. Now, as far as the lunar months, so, so biblical months would end up being um, 1,657 and you know, 
10 days or something like that, 11 days, but I don't, I don't see any significance in 1657. So I, I don't, I don't have anything on that, but <clears throat> it might be something that I don't notice. So, so here we can connect the general conference in 1886 to the symbol of rebellion, right? Right, correct. Okay, and then we're going to connect that to December 6th, 2020. Correct. Um, but now we're going to say that Manoa is from Zora. So would Zora represent uh, FFA? Would it represent the organization uh, rejecting rest? And see, it's kind of interesting because Manoa means from rest. Right. But it says he, he's from Zora. Um, the rejection that we experienced on December 6th of 2020 was kind of stinging as well. Okay. Um, I guess it could have been. I, I, don't, I wasn't particularly stunned, but... Well, the the manner in which it came, and I'll speak for myself. Yeah. When I was down there for these meetings that they that they were looking to hold, when I went the first time that year and I flew back down, I was being told very directly that I needed to join with those, and by those I mean Larry Hine. I mean, Guy McConnell, that were being directed by Bronwyn. Yeah. And when the communication was cut off, it wasn't just that the access to their Zoom meetings were cut off. It was communication in total was cut off. Yeah. No more communication. Yeah. When was that? Was that what? December sixth? That was before December sixth, right? No, it was no. sixth. It was December sixth and after because once the pronouncement was made on December sixth, there was a couple of days after that that they basically removed people from access to their Zoom. Yeah, and they weren't going to, and they weren't going to also uh, communicate with anybody, right. at least with. Um, they did their communication beforehand and then they just basically wrote us off. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So in, in the, um, in the Hebrew, when you look at Zora, it has the mem in front of it, just as Noah does. So really, it's he's from Noah, would be, you know, if you're going to translate it. But of course, they just put rest, because he's from rest. Right. But, uh, yeah, so in, in the Hebrew, it just says, you know, it came to pass that this man... Uh, one man, literally in Hebrew, Ichad, Ish Ichad, uh, Mesora. So it just says from from Zora, and then it says um, uh, about his family, Mitzpaot, um, and then it says uh, from the fa so he's from the family of the Danites. So again, you have a mem. In front mem mitzvot. So you have all these mems in front of things in Hebrew. So so he's from Zora, he's from the family of the of the Danites. Right? Right. So the Danites is a judge, which you noted. And um and let me see here. 
So I'm just looking at this here, trying to figure out what this is. Okay, that's kind of odd. Meaning? Um, I'm just trying to look at the Hebrew, trying to figure out why this word is not, um, it's not really mentioned. You know, trying to figure out which, how they're translate, what they're translating this word as. Oh, whose name? Okay, so his name, his designation was Manoah. So here you have this man who's from Zora, from the family of the Danites, uh, but he's named from Noah. Okay. So, so if we take that idea, he's from these two other things, but he has a name that he's from Noah. Would that what would that represent in our line? Because because in in trying to create these lines here yesterday, um, uh, you know we had we had drawn this representation here of trying to figure out how we were going to relate these forty years to um, to these lines, right? Okay. Now, so, so here's what we drew. It's, um, now we're going to take this as being nine eleven, right? But when yeah. so that's verses one and two. We have this, um, but that's going to come up. Manoah is going to be mentioned then, but he's going to be mentioned also in thirteen verse eight. So in thirteen verse eight, we have him men mentioned where he entreats the Lord. And, and so in trying to understand this here, uh, you know, we're taking this, we're taking this and we're placing this over at the end, really, of, of this period of time, to some degree, symbolically, with December 6th. So, so I'd, I'd, I'd put 13.8, that's going to be 2004, that we have, um, this message of the 2520. So I'm looking at Noah as being the message of the 2520, Manoah. Um, and then when that arrives in 2004, so Stephen and I discussed a little bit about, you know, when did the 2520 come into the movement? We still haven't really established if we can put that as 2004. But I'm, I'm looking at the camp meeting in Ozone, Arkansas. Even though the 2520 is not presented there, it is known about at that time. So, so we have these two, uh, we have, well, three December 6th, right? We have a December 6th in 1885, in 1886, and in 2020. Right. All right. So how, how do we relate that all together? How do we relate? I mean, it's a lot of things we're trying to pull together. So we're, we're not doing a great job, but um, we will sort it out, I believe. We've got a lot of elements here. We've got a lot of a lot of points to be sorted out. The point, right. Right, the point right now, when we're looking at this at this situation, we we understand that thirteen is a number of rebellion, right? Right. Yeah. Now, what occurred? on December 6th of 2020 is also a type of rebellion mm -hmm. because it's rejecting a message. It's rejecting a message that is not of man, but it is from God. Okay. Now, 
wasn't, I mean, the, the situation that was occurring that led up to 1888, you had a battle between Dr. Wagner and President Butler that went before the entire general conference. This led to the issue that came in 1888. Now, when we realized, when we recognized the fact that these general conference sessions were being held annually, not every four years like we're used to right now, yeah. that these things, when, when a problem was occurring, they were being addressed and sometimes addressed multiple times within the minds of those that were attending these sessions. So by the time you come from 1886 and you come down to 1888, you have people that have made up their minds. They were either going to be, yes, we're, we are in agreement with what Mrs. White has said, or no, we are not in agreement. And therefore, we're in rebellion. And 1888 is certainly a, another symbol of rebellion. But the seeds of 1888 began in 1886. Okay. So the way that I would relate this is I'm going to take, um, so we're going to take Zora because we're now applying it to our history, right? We're taking 1886 and we can now look at December 6th and we can tie um, Zora to this number 6881 as being a representation of 1886. Right. Right. So we can take 1886. We can take this camp meeting. We can see this rebellion, a rejection of the message that's beginning, but it becomes a um, the rebellion that happens in 1888 starts there. And we could say within this movement, what happens in 2020 on December 6th, that the seeds of that rebellion infect the movement. Right. And that that. Um, when we get to December 21st or December 25th, 2021, we, we have the parallel to 1888 in that sense. Correct. So I hope everybody followed that. It, to me, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward that we can parallel 1888 with the end of our 777 structure. And, and we can see that, that FFA is repeating that history, but also not just FFA, but people within the movement or the movement itself, I guess you could say, is repeating that history. Where, where, where individuals stand is a different matter. So now as far as Manoa is of the Danites, so he's from Zora, he's from the family of the Danites, but his name is from Rest. And of course, this represents the 2520, but it also represents righteousness by faith. Exactly. Okay. Now, whether we're going to have to restructure our lines and how we're approaching Samson or not, I, I don't know. Um, but we can definitely see the parallel, at least at the end of our line. Now, part of, part of the problem is when we go to uh, Judges 13 then, so I'll go back to the scriptures here. So we have the birth of Samson, and this, in a sense, is this whole chapter is leading up to the birth of Samson. Right. Um, and, and so it gives us this sort of history. Right. And if you if you wanted to put this as a chiasm, 
you can have this history mentioned here that's going to tie us to 1886. But it's also going to relate to when we get uh, to Judges 13.8. So remember that this is a reverse of 8.13, right? Daniel 8.13, Palmoni. And um, so the man of God is going to entreat the Lord and, and ask him what it is we shall do. Teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Um, and then we're going to have, and this, this thing about the name is mentioned, right? So um, he neither told me his name. So that's in verse six, right? So, he, so she didn't know where he uh, asked him not. Whence he was, neither told me his, me his name. And then um, after this offering, that's going to be uh, a 13, 18. And we can see that this still is a representation of, because it has the same digits in it as 13, 8, just has the one extra one. But uh, the, the angel of the Lord, which we determined is Christ, says, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? And of course, we know this connects us to Palmoni, right? So, so you could be arguing that there is a chiasm in here with this Manoah at the beginning and the Manoah at the end. Is that what you're arguing? Or is well, that? That's, that's part of it. Okay. But the situ see, the situation right now is that there's there's quite a symbol here because I'm asking directly, is this message of Samson yeah. interrelated with the message of July 18th? Well, yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, in, in looking at this, and I'm, I'm having to look at... I'm, I'll say it this way. I am being led to look at this chapter a little differently, but in the same vein as we have been addressing over the last several months. We have... The wife getting a message yeah but this is a barren woman mm -hmm. right so we we say it relates to the church i i'm saying it very directly now yeah. whether we whether we say it relates to the church or to the movement i mean we could go either way i'm making the application that it relates to the church yeah, well, that's, yeah, so we would say it relates to the church because that's the barren woman. Okay. Right. So the message comes to the barren woman, an unfruitful church, very much like the unfruitful fig tree that we find in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. So she's recognizing this countenance. She's recognizing the fact that the bearer of the message is of God. Right. And this is the angel of Revelation 18. All right. This is 9-11. This is But even the church today recognized the fact that the message of the destruction of Nashville had come from the prophet of God. Right? Yeah. But I ask him not whence he was, and was is in italics, so it's a supplied word. Neither told me his name. Now, 
it is ironic that the church recognizes that this move that this message came from the prophet but they still didn't want to give the message right yeah but this is also an ironic uh, story correct yeah but he said unto me behold thou shalt conceive and bear a son and now drink no wine nor strong drink neither eat any unclean thing for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, of course, one of the things we see here, which we saw before, we didn't discuss yesterday, but I mean, this is a parallel to Christ. No disagreement. So we discussed that previously, but not yesterday. And, and that's been noted by lots of people, um, not just us. So, but the unfruitful church is the one that's bearing the message to the husband. And my application there, as I was being led on this, was that the husband, could that represent the movement? Right. So that represents the movement FFA. But, but we also know that it's Manoah. And so within this movement, right? Which right. From FA, it has this history. It's of the Danites. It, it's from the Danites. It's from um, Zora, from FFA. But this this specifically is is this man is Manoah, right? So he's from. So this is a message that that has this line of descent, so to speak. It's right. from this barren church, the SDA church. It's also from. Zora, it's also from the Danites, which is the judge. Dan is going to be the tribe that's removed. It's not of the 144,000, right? Right. And, and, and this message, Samson's going to come from this message. So all of these things are representing, yeah, wasn't FFA on Bumblebee Lane? Yes. Bumblebee Road. Well, bubble, yeah, Bumblebee Road, but it's Bumblebee, and it was north Bumblebee Road. Right. Okay. Um, so, so you have this bumblebee, you have this, uh, this symbol of, uh, was it a hornet or something? Or... Correct. Yeah, because we had, we had North 759 Bumblebee Road. Yeah. North Bumblebee Road. Right. So you got the north there. And um, so so this message of Samson comes from all of that. It comes from the message of the 2520, the message of righteousness by faith as well, because those are both tied together. Um, it comes from FFA. It comes from the Baron Church. And, and FFA here in this sense um, where Manoah comes from. So, I mean, in a sense, you can say that these are all the, the foundation of the message of Samson comes from all of these things. Would that make sense? I guess another way of looking at this, here we have this ironic story. This It's telling an ironic story of this movement, right? So it's going to go back and review the history of this movement, but with this story of Samson. And, and in doing that, it's going to show clearly what this movement is about, what the men message of Samson is about. But it's, it's going to do it in this ironic way. And I know we have trouble dealing with this sort of ironic story because obviously everything isn't exactly the opposite. Um, but we can see that the message of July 18th is, is a message that is, is restorative. It, it's established upon a foundation that was laid before, but in some ways it's, it's almost seen as a rejection of by other people anyway, 
because it is a rejection of the church to some degree. Yes. And not, not because the church isn't from God. It's because the church has departed from God. But it has to be a rejection in the right way. Um, one of my arguments against what I've seen all my years as an Adventist is the people that are opposed to the problems in the church are exactly like the church. That their problems mostly arise from jealousy rather than from uh, a true abhorrence of sin. They just want that same power. And when they get it, they're actually worse than the church. So we need a message that's going to truly bring us out of Babylon, so to speak. Not that the church is Babylon, but the church is in Babylon. It's in a Babylonian captivity. And we think that separating from the church, not going to church, talking about its sins, pointing out all the problems in the church. Um, how did we come up to say that FFA is a barren church? I don't think we said FFA is a barren church. That was just a comment in the chat. Barren church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. So is, is FFA married to the barren church? I would say yes. Or, or at least related, because I mean, he comes from Zora, which is um, FFA. We have this message that comes from FFA. It's a it's a message that is uh, married to the the Adventist Church, and and that I've seen, you know, through the time that we've that I've been in this movement, is that you know, and, and what I'm trying to say is that. We see we see the problems in the church, but we really are of, the, are of the same character. We have a relationship with the church. What happens to most of the people who leave this movement? Where do they go? They go back into the corporate church. Go back to the corporate church, right? They that's because they really sympathize. They're really of that same spirit or character as the church itself. They can't see their relationship to the church. They want to be separated from the church, but they're really in love with the church. They love this barren woman. Right. Now, of course, this is about a message, right? That is the message of Manoah that's going to then, with its relationship with the church, that has come from Zora. So it's it's related to FFA. This message is going to still bear Samson. It's going to bear a son. But he's not to be defiled with wine, right? And he's not supposed to eat unclean things. You know, it has to do with doctrine and messages. And it's supposed to be consecrated to God. But of course, we're going to see that Samson really doesn't follow any of that. I mean, he's he's apostate he's in rebellion right this is representing our movement but in spite of the fact that this movement is being represented in rebellion it's ultimately going going to fulfill god's purposes and so when we look at something like december 6th and we get an us and them attitude right thinking well you know, they cut us off. They're the bad ones. Or we look at the conflict, you know, previously in, in chapter 12 with the Ephraimites. We can characterize ourselves as the ones in the right. But, but we're really no different. Now, of course, this is about messages. But people are attached to messages, right? Right. Correct. So, so we always have to keep that distinction here and that clarification. So this isn't talking about pe people. Even, even directly, it's not necessarily talking about FFA. It's talking about the actions or the message of FFA that's going to be manifested 
in the December 6, 2020 declaration, because that's going to parallel um, 1886 and those 13 months of rebellion, uh, 1885 to 1886, if you want to look at it that way, uh, from as a symbol, whether 1885 had that issue or not, it's not really the point. Um, it just gives us the symbol of 13 months. And um, so so when we when we try to draw this on a line here, so I'm just going to go back to these lines. So that's what we're going to try to do this week. You know, I'm going back here, just putting these down on a line. Um, but we know if we start to, that there's almost a few lines in this story itself. I mean, the first part is addressing 9-11. But this movement, um, and 9-11 comes... Uh, 12 years after 1989, right? Correct. So, so we had had we had dealt with this before, with the 12 years and the 18 years to be the 30 years. And, um, but as an inclusive count, I mean, if you counted 1989 as the first year and 2001 as the last year, it would be 13 years. Right? Correct. Okay. So we can see, in a sense, that there is a type of rebellion represented here. Um, but, but within our history itself, so from 1989 to whether you go, go to December 26th uh, or December 6th, 2020, you're going to have this movement confronted with all of these messages. And yet the movement, FFA, the one that began this, is going to basically reject that whole history as, as wrong, right? I mean, the December 6th, 2020 declaration is a rejection of everything Jeff taught. Because it undermines everything Jeff taught, even if it doesn't professedly reject everything Jeff taught. Because the only way that you can can reject July 18th is to undermine the foundation. So I don't know where all the different people stand who agreed with that declaration, but I can't see them continuing to promote Jeff's movement and the things that were taught. They're definitely not doing it now. Right. Nobody knows of anything that FFA is doing or the people who were in the movement at that time that accepted the declaration that they're actively promoting what Jeff taught. Now, within the movement itself, still, we have people who are promoting some of what Jeff taught. But are we any different if we reject chronology than the December 6th, 2020 declaration? Don't no. we see, yeah, we see basically um, that many people in the movement are in sympathy with that declaration, even if they wouldn't say so, right? Because of their, their rejection of the, the symbolic numbers and so forth. So they would say, well, you accept July 18th, on some level, but they reject the reasoning that led to July 18th. This would be like somebody accepting October 22, 1844, but rejecting lots of the message of Samuel Snow and of Miller. Right? And, and you can't at one hand say, I accept October 22nd, 1844, but I'm now going to set a date for the second coming of Christ. Because we just we just got the wrong date. 
right? Because people were time setting when Ellen White says they couldn't, because that would be a rejection of, of that message. I know it's, it's a little bit scattered here right now in this study, but you can see where we're going here. At least I hope people can. So I don't think there's anything wrong with what I've drawn here. It's just that we need the overall structure to understand these events. And we can tie these to these verses. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> so maybe uh, let's look at more of your, your uh, suggestions there. So when we deal with um, what you say here, then this is an important point. Christ came to the woman church as she sat in the field in activity, not sowing or reaping. She ran to her husband and became active, seeking him, the membership of the movement. The husband arose and went with his wife and sought answers. So this is a message that is an examination of the message that the woman receives. So this is the woman receives the message is 9-11, right? Right. Okay. And, and so we're going to have a message that's an examination of 9-11. And um, Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. What shall be the manner of the child and what shall be his work? Right. So this is uh, Manoah talking to Christ. So examining 9-11. Um, and then we have some spirit of prophecy quotes. It is a deplorable fact that there's a widespread neglect of those precepts of the Bible which have a bearing upon life and health. Um, so this is addressing what uh, the symbol, at least, of that he's not going to drink wine or strong drink. But the mother is also not to drink the wine or strong drink. Right. Yeah. So it's not supposed to. So the church is not supposed to. But the church literally in our history does. Right. But in this ironic story, we don't see that. So the church is not to, but this, the movement isn't to either. Right. Yeah. But Manoah is married to the woman. So, but Manoah isn't given this injunction because this is a message, of course. Right. But um, he's going to come out of this, uh, Samson's going to come out of this barren church and be a descendant of Manoah. So, Again, we can see there's this injunction, whether it's followed or not in this story, doesn't say, but we would believe that she does. But in this, in this situation. Well, this is ironic. Okay. Yes, this is ironic. So in, in following through this, yeah. many make the subject a matter of jest. They claim that the Lord does not concern himself with such minor matters as our eating and drinking. But if the Lord had had no care for these things, he would not have revealed himself as he did to the wife of Manoah, giving her definite instructions respecting her habits of life and twice enjoining upon her to beware lest she disregard them. So there's a doubling there. In my point exactly. Is not this sufficient evidence that the Lord is not indifferent in regard to these matters and does not look upon them as unimportant? Now, here again, we will be giving a message to the world. Mm -hmm. Here is an exact point that the matters of diet are important. But here is the matters of diet for the movement today. Because the eating and drinking, taking in no wine, 
we are not to accept any other doctrine yeah. than what has been already given through scripture and through the study with the use of Miller's rules. Well, one one point that 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 I that I've noted a number of times is, you know, people will send me videos, right? They will, you know, save to serve or different things like that. Um, and and especially in connection with the pandemic, you know, different sermons made by people, um, and and people in our movement were watching a lot of this information, right? And and I could not understand why. I mean, when people would send me stuff, I say, "Why are you watching this?" You know, this. I mean, it one is it has error in it. Um, now, doesn't mean I don't observe things because I mean, I have all kinds of discussions with people and read different types of material, but I don't accept it sort of as a message from God, where people will accept these as messages from God. Like this was a fantastic sermon or whatever it is that they're going to send me. And uh, and sometimes these messages are from people who are totally have uh, rejected this message. Right. So I, I don't understand it. I mean, to me, that would be this injunction here to Samson. Well, to Samson's parents, to Samson's mother uh, regarding the message of Samson, right? Because Samson is going to be a message. So she has to be, um, in this context, uh, not drinking wine or strong drink. But yet, that's what this movement has been doing. So everything's ironic here in that sense. So now the other part of that from that quote, or excuse me, the other part that was paired with this quote. Yeah. God had important work for the promised child of Manoah to do, and it was to secure for him the qualifications necessary for this work that the habits of both the mother and the child were to be so carefully regulated. So the mother, the church, the child, the message. Neither let her drink wine nor strong drink was the angel's injunction for the wife of Manoah, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I've commanded her, let her observe. The child will be affected for good or for evil by the habits of the mother. She must herself be controlled by principle and must practice temperance and self-denial if she would seek the welfare of her child. Mm -hmm. So there's there, there's actually quite a bit within this portion. No, I know. And we went through a lot of this already. Right? We did. So we read all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, what we're looking for is the things that are going to help us put this on a line. Correct, and and so we can see that um, in in the in the actual in the story itself, it's different than what happened in actuality. So the church didn't follow this injunction, right? Right, and yet Samson still ends up coming out of the church, right? I mean, this movement comes from Adventism, right? This comes from Adventism. But this movement where you have Samson, we, we're showing the rebellion in a sense, the rebellion side of this movement in Samson. And yet still Samson is victorious. So that, that's always the difficulty with this story. Now, as far as the chiastic structure, we're going to have to address that more again tomorrow. Right. But, um, you know, I see that we can connect it to the past, but I think that the chiasm if it exists, is more within the movement itself. I would agree. Anyway, let's uh, close with prayer. 
Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the time that we have had. We know that we don't understand everything, and um, we need your help in our continued personal study, and we need your spirit of meekness and openness that we can look at these things and um, that any, any sin in our lives can be exposed, that we can have your conviction of your Holy Spirit. Be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over each one. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.